Good morning. Welcome to our class again together as we continue our study of 2 Peter. Today we are in 2 Peter chapter 2 as we end the chapter with verses 20 to 22. I'm glad you joined me and we can move on as we move together. I hope you've had a good Thanksgiving as well and uh, we can move toward Christmas now. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall and all of the king's horses and all of the king's men could never put Humpty Dumpty back together again. It's a popular nursery rhyme, but nothing fits better for this lesson than that. The great fall that no one can, unbe that can be undone. In the second chapter, 2 Peter, he has detailed the coming of these false teachers. He's described their character, their stubborn hold on error, and their enticement of the unstable. It was Peter's warning to future generations of the danger that they will face. But today, we want to take the last step in that saga. We want to go to the very end of the road. Where does following evil lead? What happens if you start listening to the voices disparaging Scripture and replacing it with clever notions of men? It's not a pretty picture, one that ends in an absolutely revolting image. So what is the inevitable destruction of the false teachers and their followers? We come to this passage we, and we can find where it all begins. Peter has said in the first verse of the chapter that the false teachers would come from within. They would always arise from within the church. They would begin by being followers of Christ. That tended to be the pattern for many, many years. But some, when they come to this part of the New Testament, they begin to question that because it grates on them. They believe that had the teachers really been following Christ, they would not have done such things, and that's the proof they never did follow Christ. It's the proof they were never converted. And yet Peter says that this is about their free fall. He's emphatic about it, in fact. In verse 20 he says, for if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse than the, for them than the first. He says two terms to dispel the myth of the phantom believer. First, they had escaped. Now we all know about escape. Someone's in prison or in chains and they get out and they leave. That's escape. But the Greek term adds nuance to that basic sense. It includes the turning back on what used to be true about their lives. These were Christians whose conversion showed that they turned away from the sordid lives that they once lived. It is a change of behavior. That's what the term escape indicates. But secondly, it says they had come to the knowledge of Jesus. Now, knowledge is more than just pure facts. That is one level of knowledge. But this is a term that means to recognize Jesus and who He is and what they, He had done for them. This is the basic concept of faith that obeys. It's a strong statement that says they had already decided to follow Jesus and made that decision because they recognized who He was and what He was doing. So it seems clear that when Peter gives this thumbnail sketch of their lives before they turn to false teaching, he's emphasizing that they were already Christians. They were followers of Christ, but now they had forsaken their former life of sin. But the teaching and philosophy they espoused caused everything to turn very dark. They turn away from Christ into the error and their own teaching. And again, Peter uses two terms to describe the difference. For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. He says they were entangled. They were caught in a net of error. 
They saw it as something that gave them superiority and privilege and freedom. It made them somebody special. And it's hard not to be enticed and when you're so entwisted in the cords of that kind of thinking. It happens in sex all the time. It made them somebody special. It fed their base lust. It gave them what they wanted. Their newfound way of life provided them with an easy income by fleecing the unwary as they've turned their head in their directions. False teachers are kind of like carnival barkers who enjoyed the attention and made easy marks at the midway. Then, Peter says it overcame them. For that, he decides to pull a word out of the military lexicon that indicates defeat and capture. They lost the battle with sin, and now they were prisoners making their home in a new state. They now served a new master called evil, and it had it firmly had them firmly in their grasp. And Peter paints a very bleak picture of this fall. For if they've, after they've escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first. Worse than the first. Sad words that weep over the spiritual condition of the teachers. But how could it be worse? Well, Peter goes on to explain himself. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to have turned back from the holy commandment delivered to them. How can it be better not to have known? Isn't any taste of Christianity better than none at all? Now we tend to be sort of Pollyannish about this verse. Isn't it better to know the way in some, some form or fashion. If you do, maybe there's hope. If you knew it once, you, you could come back. But Peter allows no such sentimentality. It is better, he says, if they had never known the way than to have turned back. This is not a prodigal son story. You know the story of Luke 15. A boy gets antsy to live on his own with daddy's money. So he takes his share of the inheritance, goes to the far country where he wasted on false friends and free living. But the money runs out, and he ends up in a pig pen. But then he comes to himself and runs to his father, and all seem to be forgiven. We love that story. It's one of the most favored of most people. But that's not this story. This, is, this one is no happily ever after tale. It grits its teeth and clenches its fists. It's not about redemption, but despair. Why? Is it better never to have known? I think it's important to remember the context of the statement. In the first verse, Peter gives a broad overview of the false teachers. But false prophets also arose among the people. Just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. One statement in that verse tells the story behind the despair. The teachers have denied the master who bought them. They came to Christ in the first place because they recognized, they knew Him, remember? They recognized Him as the one who could save them from their sins, who could put them in God's way. They recognized His state. He was the one that brought them. Now they though they have turned their back on Him and they refuse to see His proper place. And if you cannot see Him as your salvation, you'll find none. That was true at the beginning. It's also true here. Without faith, you can't come. Without the belief that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, divine and human all at once, who saves a man from their sins, who becomes their Lord and Savior, it's worthless. They've denied all of those things. 
They've pushed them aside. I've said, we don't want to believe it. One proverb says, the wise man knows which bridge to cross and which bridge to burn. The teachers chose to burn the bridge over which only they could return, the saving grace of Jesus Christ. When they rejected him, they burned that bridge and they couldn't come back. Because without coming to Christ as Savior, they could never come back. So they have returned to the previous state without any way out. So now they're left on their own without any hope. It's a dead end with nowhere to go. But to capture this terrible state in which they find themselves, Peter provides a stomach-churning image. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to his own vomit, and the sow, after washing her cells, returns to the wallow in the mire. They have become the most detestable creatures of Peter's time. For the Jews, pork was synonymous with being unclean, almost poison. It was something that demonstrated how filthy something really is. If you compared it to a pig, it was one of the filthiest things that you could do. And dogs, they weren't the cuddly little lap dogs that we have today, the ones that sleep on our couches that we take for a walk, that we pat on the head. No, they were roaming pack animals looking for prey. They reeked with odor, infested with fleas and filth. And they were considered worse than a nuisance. They were a danger. Peter says that they have become dogs and hogs. And the pictures are absolutely revolting. Now, anyone who has owned a dog knows the experience that Peter talks of. The dog vomits and then for some reason goes back to it. It's something you cannot watch. You cannot bear to watch it. You just turn away and, and hope for the end to come soon. And it's that image that is so vivid and so terrible. And it will turn your stomach. But he gets it from the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 26 and verse 11. The wise man says, It is like a dog that returns to his vomit is a fool who repeats his folly. If you've already learned the lesson, don't go back to it. If you've already been in the mess, don't go back to it. If you've already gotten sick from it, don't return to it. Only a fool does that. It's a damning statement. They don't, they don't see the folly of their own actions. That what they once were, they wanted to leave. They're now they're back into it at worse than they were. It's like a dog and its vomit. When you don't learn and you return to the life that you left once. The pig, which is washed, cannot wait to start to wallow in the mire again. Peter calls it mire or or mud, or however you want to put it, but the, the Greek phrase comes over into English as barbarian. A barbarian is someone who's slimy, and smelly, and foul. It described the invading Goths as they came across the border, invading a collapsing Rome. The barbarians were at the gate. The smelly, filthy men from the north. So he says, such it is with the false teachers. And they have become much like the barbarians. They are the hogs that wallow in the muck after they've been cleaned and they just want to get dirty again. There is nothing pleasant, nothing redemptive, nothing holy about these images. It is the worst end that a person can absolutely imagine. A dog in front of the vomit and a mud-coated hog. And that is the spiritual condition the teachers enjoy. Now think about the image for a moment. 
Would you want to be in that situation? Would you want to find yourself like the dog in the hog who has returned to an old life that was never satisfying in the first place and now is even less so, but it's all that you have left? Is that not a terrible feeling? An intensely tragic circumstance? So as Peter ends the chapter on false teachers, he brings us to the very end, to the pig pen with all of its odors and its germs. He says, do you really want to live in pig slop? The teachers are best described by a Persian proverb that said, he who knows not and knows not that he knows not is a fool, shun him. He who knows not and knows that he knows not is a child, teach him. He who knows and knows not that he knows is asleep, wake him. He who knows and knows that he knows is wise, follow him. The teachers were the fool that should be shunned. But they would invade the church in all generations, even to the day where we still have to put up with what happens. The judgment is still the same. You finally reach an end where there is no more hope because you have rejected the Christ who can bring you back. And so Peter warns his generation and the successive generations, and he warns us as well. If Peter were to speak directly to us today, what do you think he would say? I think one sentence might capture everything he wants to say in the second chapter. Beware the hand that leads you, lest they take you where they are. For we listen to any voice even if it sounds intelligent, even if it sounds reasonable, even if they use sprinkles of Scripture in various places, be very, very careful and find out where it's going to lead you because if you follow it, that's where you're going to go to, exactly where they are. So Peter says, don't follow them. Stay with the inspired Scripture and with Christ. That's the only way you'll get to where you really want to be. Thank you for joining me today, and uh, I hope you have a good day, and next week we'll be back with another lesson from 2 Peter as we enter 2 Peter chapter 3 about the scoffers. Have a great day, and we'll see you later.